Nazi Germany's war machine was a dominant force during World War II due to its cutting-edge weaponry like tanks, aircraft, and powerful guns. But what happened to these tools of war after Germany's defeat in 1945? The journey of captured German weapons from the battlefields to their final destinations weaves a fascinating tale of history, politics, and intrigue. Join us as we uncover the little-known story of what became of the vast German arsenal following the end of the Second World War, Allies' Distribution Dilemmas. In the aftermath of World War II, the Allied powers found themselves in control of a massive stockpile of captured German weapons, vehicles, and equipment. With Nazi Germany defeated and disarmed, the Allies faced complex challenges in deciding how to divide the spoils of war among themselves. This dilemma involved navigating a web of post-war agreements, security concerns, and the delicate task of restoring stability in war-ravaged Europe. The distribution of German weapons among the Allies was governed by a series of pacts and accords established near the war's end in 1945. The purpose was to ensure a balanced and equitable allocation aligned with each nation's contributions. However, beneath these diplomatic efforts lurked divergent strategic interests and emerging tensions between the Allies. The Soviet Union argued for the lion's share of German material, having faced the brunt of Nazi aggression on the Eastern Front. Meanwhile, the United States and Great Britain focused on acquiring advanced technology for analysis and integrating it into their own arsenals. France, having suffered under German occupation, was wary of a rearmed Germany and sought harsh disarmament. A key factor was the contribution each nation made to the Allied war effort. The Soviet Red Army's colossal sacrifices led to demands for reparations in the form of German industrial equipment. At the Yalta and Potsdam conferences, Stalin secured promises for about 25% of recoverable industrial assets from the Western zones. This included German military hardware. However, the Western allies were hesitant to fulfill such substantial transfers, fearing strengthened Soviet power. Disagreements over reparations and access to German technology strained relations. The Allies also considered strategic value when dividing the spoils. Air and rocket technology was especially coveted, while surplus small arms were of lesser interest. There were also debates over the demilitarization of Germany. The French pushed for the harsh dismantling of German military power. But the US and Britain, eyeing Soviet expansionism, eventually favored a rearmed West Germany as a Cold War ally. This led the Western Allies to be more open to repurposing German weapons, vehicles, and facilities for the new West German military, the Bundeswehr. The emerging Cold War dynamics influenced how German technology was allocated. Both superpowers raced to seize advanced weapons to deny them falling into each other's hands. The Americans and British scoured Nazi research sites for technical documents and assets. Projects such as Operation Paperclip tried recruiting German scientists. Each side saw the potential of German innovations to tilt the balance of power. Beyond weapons, vehicles, and concrete equipment, another form of spoils was innovative military research and technology itself. This came not just in the form of physical materials and documents, but in the expertise contained within the German scientific community. Both the USSR and the Western Allies engaged in extensive programs to locate and acquire this intellectual property. The Soviets dismantled and transported whole factories and research institutes back into the USSR. The Americans scooped up troves of documents and infrastructure from sites like the secretive Nazi facility in Skoda, Czechoslovakia, the Soviet scramble. For the Soviet Union, World War II's end marked both victory and an opportunity to cement its new status as a global superpower. The torrent of German weapons, technology, and equipment seized by the advancing Red Army represented war booty that could rapidly expand Soviet military might. Moscow wasted no time in repurposing the arsenal of its defeated foe. Unlike the Western Allies who saw German weapons as main sources of intelligence, the Soviets focused on the immediate integration of this hardware into their active forces. With the infrastructure of Western Russia devastated by the Nazi onslaught, German tanks, artillery, rifles, and more were pressed into service to rebuild combat divisions. By June 1945, 
the Red Army had recovered over 4,100 German tanks and self-propelled guns from battlefields and depots. Hundreds were refurbished and sent to equip Soviet armored and mechanized units. German Panther and Tiger tanks, far superior to most Soviet models, saw extensive testing, and Germany's dreaded 88mm anti-aircraft gun became a staple of Russian artillery battalions. Captured German small arms also replenished Red Army stocks after four years of grinding warfare. Soviet factories transitioned slowly from wartime production, and German weapons helped fill the gap. The sturdy Car 98K bolt-action rifle, MP40 submachine gun, and MG-34 machine gun all saw second lives in Soviet hands. These captured weapons tided over the USSR's forces until domestic production ramped back up. However, Stalin and the Soviet High Command had bigger plans for German technology than merely expanding their inventory of tanks and guns. The real prize was the advanced research embedded in Nazi weapons development. The Soviets systematically dismantled German factories and research institutes, shipping them east. The Soviet military-industrial complex swelled with the influx of German engineering expertise. Teams of German scientists and technicians were compelled at gunpoint to continue their work for the Soviet state. The most coveted of these experts were rocket engineers, whose V-2 ballistic missiles awe-struck the Allies. Under the new appellation of Sergei Korolev, Werner von Braun and hundreds of his colleagues were put to work reproducing the V-2 and developing successors. This crash program bore fruit in the post-war period as Soviet missiles and rockets terrorized the West. The rapid absorption of German technology and know-how gave the post-war Soviet military a massive boost. Technologies like jet engines, advanced submarines, and rocketry leapt ahead years by exploiting German research. For decades to come, the descendants of these repurposed weapons would empower the USSR as a dominant force on the global stage. The Soviet scramble for the remains of Hitler's war machine entwined the defeated Reich with the rise of its communist rival, exploiting German ingenuity. As Allied forces penetrated the frontiers of the fading Third Reich, they encountered a bonanza of advanced weaponry and technology. As this arsenal was secured and catalogued, the Western Allies initiated various efforts to harness German military innovations for their own strategic interests. This exploitation took the form of seizing physical assets and infrastructure, as well as recruiting German expertise. The Western Allied powers, principally the US and UK, took a more cautious approach to captured German weapons than the rapid repurposing by the Soviets. Huge stockpiles of Nazi material, from small arms to tanks to artillery pieces, were accumulated at classified military facilities and meticulously documented. Rifles were test-fired, tanks were dismantled for study, and explosives were carefully disarmed. The Allies saw German technology as holding valuable insights for their military advancement. Teams of American and British scientists, engineers, and military thinkers carefully evaluated the specifications and performance of weapons like the V-2 rocket, Mi-262 jet fighter, and STG-44 assault rifle. Documents and prototypes seized from research sites provided critical intelligence about emerging concepts. For the U.S., rapidly transitioning its forces and industrial base from peacetime to wartime footing during World War II, analyzing German technology allowed them to shortcut certain developmental steps. America's atomic bomb program also benefited from confiscated German nuclear research. This probing of Hitler's sophisticated military-industrial complex aided the Allies' own post-war efforts. An especially ambitious U.S. program was Operation Paperclip, spearheaded by the Office of Strategic Services. This controversial initiative involved recruiting over 1,500 German scientists, engineers, and technicians to work in the U.S. under new identities. Many Paperclip recruits were involved in aerospace, munitions, or rocketry projects for the Nazis. Their specialized expertise was deemed a national security asset by the Americans. Werner von Braun, who built the V-2 rocket with slave labor, became a celebrated figure in the U.S. space program. Other paperclip Germans made significant contributions to Cold War missile systems, jet engines, and biological warfare programs. 
These defectors gave the U.S. an edge in the frantic race for technological supremacy versus the Soviets. American and British teams also dismantled German industrial sites and extensively documented research data. Just the research complex near Skoda in Czechoslovakia yielded eight trainloads worth of materials shipped west, from Nazi to NATO. In the wake of Germany's total defeat in 1945, Allied plans for post-war Europe involved harsh disarmament and demilitarization of the vanquished Reich. But the rapidly escalating Cold War soon forced a reversal of course. By 1955, West Germany had been transformed into a critical military bastion against Soviet expansion through the controversial rearming of the new Bundeswehr with surplus German and American weaponry. The prospect of rebuilding any kind of German armed forces so soon after World War II was vehemently opposed, especially by European nations that had suffered under Nazi occupation. The French in particular pushed for long-term disarmament to neutralize German military power. However, the emerging communist threat altered strategic calculations. As tensions with the Soviet Union mounted, the Western Allies came to see a rearmed West Germany integrated into a collective security pact as vital to preventing Western Europe from falling under Stalin's control. The German military was officially dissolved in 1946. But just two years later, the Bundeswehr was formed as the armed forces of the new Federal Republic of Germany. The threat posed by the Soviet-backed GDR regime in East Germany and aggressive Soviet moves necessitated NATO having a German contingent to defend Western Europe. This radical shift was enabled by the desperation of Cold War real politic overriding the legacy of World War II hostility. The Korean War also influenced America's position. The backlash against calls for Allied disarmament pushed the U.S. to press its reluctant World War II partners to allow German rearmament. However, France placed limits, capping the new Bundeswehr at just 12 divisions with restrictions on armaments. America provided early funding and equipment with an eye on quickly integrating West Germany into NATO. The issue of where to source equipment for the Bundeswehr proved controversial. One pragmatic but unpalatable solution was using the massive stockpiles of World War II German weapons mothballed in Allied depots. This included small arms, artillery, vehicles, and even tanks. France and Britain were wary of handing over sophisticated equipment to former enemies, but beggars couldn't be choosers in the Cold War climate. From 1950 to 1956, the Bundeswehr initially made do with a mixture of obsolete German World War II gear and some American weapons. Surplus panzers, anti-tank guns, mortars, and rifles were pulled from warehouses and rebuilt or refurbished in Germany. Pictures from the era show Bundeswehr soldiers drilling with rusty MG-42 machine guns and parading in panzers bearing swastikas painted over with crosses. This rebirth of the Heer with recycled Wehrmacht weaponry was intended as an interim measure. The intent was to phase out World War II weapons as new standardized NATO equipment was delivered, enabling force integration. The last World War II German small arms in the Bundeswehr were retired by 1960. Tanks also shifted from rebuilt Panzers to American M47 and M48 Pattons rolling off West German production lines. Within a decade, the Bundeswehr had been transformed into a robust, modernized force, closely aligned with NATO. The return of German military power so soon after Hitler's fall came as a shock to many Allied war veterans. But the perceived Soviet threat created strange bedfellows. The pragmatic priorities of the Cold War paradigm allowed former enemies to become allies against communism. This awkward reconciliation was symbolized by World War II-era German tanks being handed off to the Bundeswehr, modified swastikas still faintly visible beneath painted-over crosses. The Black Market Boom In the aftermath of the war, an unprecedented flood of surplus small arms, artillery, and vehicles inundated the global arms market. German weapons, for decades the instruments of Hitler's conquest, soon found their way into conflicts worldwide. This proliferation fueled bloody post-colonial struggles, regional disputes, and Cold War proxy battles. The massive stockpiles of German material collected by the Allies as World War II wound down necessitated disposal. 
As over 12 million German soldiers laid down their arms in 1945, Allied war planners faced the dilemma of what to do with this military surplus. While some were destroyed or recycled, much was stored long-term or simply abandoned. This created immense opportunity for black marketeers dealing in illegal weapons trafficking. In Europe, these shadowy networks profited immensely by raiding loosely guarded Allied and German arms dumps. Truckloads of rifles, machine guns, mortars, rockets, and ammunition made their way onto black markets from Greece to Portugal. Stockpiles earmarked for destruction sometimes mysteriously disappeared before they could be demolished. Africa and the Middle East became flush with black market German weapons. In the late 1940s, as Israel fought its war of independence, German Car 98 rifles and MG 42 machine guns arrived via clandestine routes to arm Haganah militias. Egyptian forces also procured ex Wehrmacht arms through illicit deals. Surplus German rifles and helmets even appeared in the Mau Mau uprising in Kenya in the 1950s. The wave of decolonization and nationalism that swept Asia opened new markets. French forces in Vietnam and Algeria faced ex-German guns supplied by Chinese and Soviet intermediaries to nationalist insurgents. In Indonesia, the Netherlands struggled to quell rebels armed with looted Japanese stocks of German weapons. Both sides of the Cold War patronized this murky web of arms dealers and smugglers. The US and USSR both quietly channeled anti-tank rockets, assault rifles and machine guns from World War II's remnants to proxies and client states worldwide throughout the 1960s and 70s, sometimes with devastating results. Meanwhile, unscrupulous profiteers reaped enormous windfalls. Today, the deadly legacy of illicitly proliferated fascist-era weapons persists in deprived corners of the world. Security analysts trace modern conflicts in places like Chad, Colombia, and Afghanistan back to decades-old caches of German arms. These antique but still lethal artifacts illustrate the complex aftershocks of 20th-century ideological warfare, scrapped and splintered. The majority of tanks, vehicles, and military ordnance faced systematic disassembly and demolition by the Allies in the wake of World War II. With the Axis war machine shattered after Germany's defeat, the scrapped remains of its once formidable arsenal were seen as both spoils and a source of critically needed resources for reconstruction efforts. Chopped up and splintered into scrap, the physical embodiment of German Marshall might found itself reduced to slag metal and anonymous ingots on foundry floors. Remnants filtered into manufacturing chains and emerged reforged in consumer goods aiding European recovery. Some material evaded immediate scrapping through chance storage and cash. In forgotten rural locations, leftovers from battlefield salvage survived to be unearthed decades later. Though most were ultimately recycled, these scattered examples escaped the smelter to serve as conserved artifacts. The sheer quantity of weapons left after the war necessitated not just warehousing or repurposing, but also mass disposal. Destroying surplus arms through target practice provided Allied forces a pragmatic solution for eliminating dangerous war material while also preparing troops. With vast stockpiles of German weapons needing demilitarization, using them for live-fire training allowed soldiers to gain familiarity with foreign equipment. Tank crews could engage panzers, Artillery units could target surrendered guns, and infantry could assault fortified anti-tank weapons. Controlled demolition of Axis weapons through combat drills also built skills. Engineers practiced calculations by targeting bridges and bunkers. Bombing units dropped ordnance on mock industrial sites. Ships exercised naval gunnery on decommissioned submarines sunk as targets. The destruction liberated space in warehouses bulging with arms slated for deactivation. It provided duty purpose to idle brigades awaiting peacetime transition. Soldiers could work off residual martial urges through the sanctioned elimination of enemy weapons, preventing unauthorized trophy hunting. Repurposed panzers outlive the Reich. After World War II, the German army was disbanded and did not reappear until the 1950s. However, many German panzers continued their service in the armies of France, Czechoslovakia, Spain, and Switzerland. Many of these vehicles were sold to Syria in the 1950s and were used in combat for the last time in the Golan Heights during the Six-Day War in 1967. 
The journey of German tanks and artillery after World War II was an odyssey of changing allegiances as these weapons switched sides from former enemy to new owner. Captured armaments seesawed between nations, handed down from fallen Reich to conquering power. Changing hands as spoils of war, many found renewed purpose in conflicts beyond Europe. Nations like France and Czechoslovakia integrated salvaged vehicles into their own militaries, sometimes after cursory repairs or modifications. Having faced these weapons in combat, practicality overcame any misgivings around appropriating the arsenal of former adversaries. The war's aftermath had created complex circumstances. In the Middle East, Cold War machinations drove new flows of arms. Former Nazi panzers and assault guns sold by European powers now dueled against the descendants of Allied armor supplied to Israel. Syrian crewmen trained by ex-Wehrmacht veterans manned old German tanks featuring swastika insignia crudely painted over. Complex legacies collided as wartime material continued to shape geopolitics. The longevity of German armor is a testament to its engineering, but also the disorderly twists of history. Tanks built for Blitzkrieg rumbled on through the Cold War as superpower proxy battles reforged the world order. Though the old panzers were ultimately outmatched by more modern tanks, their presence is a reminder of how the upheavals of World War II continued to echo through conflicts worldwide. The tanks long outlived the fallen Reich that created them, from Wehrmacht to Bundeswehr. As Cold War tensions rose, rebuilding West Germany's military was deemed essential. Surplus World War II German weapons were issued to the Bundeswehr as a temporary measure, eventually replaced by standardized NATO equipment. The controversial decision to supply surplus Nazi-era weapons to the newly constituted Bundeswehr carried heavy symbolism. Recently defeated German troops were now being rearmed, albeit under a new Western-aligned banner. Yet the realities of an escalating Cold War made the re-establishment of German military power strategically expedient. Surplus stocks of small arms and artillery offered a convenient stopgap measure, while efforts focused on consolidating a new unified defense force closely integrated with NATO allies. Standardized equipment and interoperable weaponry were eventually needed to fulfill NATO combat doctrines. The old Nazi weapons, though quickly put back into service, were steadily replaced by a modernized arsenal sharing commonalities with other allied nations. West German forces were assimilated into the Western Bloc. The rapid change from vanquished foe to crucial ally was part of stabilizing Europe's defense against external threats. Though controversial, providing Wehrmacht weapons to the Bundeswehr aided the transition and symbolized the new order emerging from World War II's ashes, marking the path from past enemy to necessary partner as the Cold War redefined power dynamics. Conservation Controversy with over 70 years of distance from World War II, a vibrant collector and preservationist community has emerged around the arsenal of Nazi Germany's war machine. This enthusiasm for recovering, restoring, and displaying German weapons from the Third Reich era provokes ethical debates around glorifying tools of atrocity versus remembering history. For many hobbyists and World War II buffs, collecting and preserving German weapons, uniforms, and equipment is a passion deeply rooted in history. Most see themselves as amateur archivists, curating important artifacts that bring tangible history alive. Meticulous restoration efforts maintain pieces in correctly configured working condition. Significant time and expense are invested in tracking down rare items from the wartime period. However, critics argue fixation on the material culture of Nazi Germany risks sanitizing World War II and those who waged it. They express discomfort at the pride and enthusiasm displayed over items like an SS officer's pistol or a rifle used at Auschwitz. The visceral thrill over such sinister memorabilia can, some argue, signal extremist sensibilities. Outright Nazi glorification remains a fringe but still disturbing element within the collector community. Museums also grapple with this issue when deciding if displaying tools of totalitarianism serves ethical purposes. Curators debate if including tanks, uniforms, and banners helps contextualize the themes of war and fascism, or unintentionally glorifies this dark past. Some museums have removed World War II German artifacts from exhibits due to concerns about proper contextualization. 
Advocates believe collecting and exhibiting even controversial artifacts has educational merit if properly presented. A Nazi armband behind glass with an exhibit panel can convey harsh truths. But critics counter that museums sometimes enable romanticizing weapons and uniforms through flashy displays seeking to impress visitors. For collectors, excluding Nazi material from preservation could allow even uglier interests to monopolize these artifacts. Perhaps through conscientious curation, the relics of evil can illuminate the dangers of its revival. But this imposes a solemn obligation, the Marshland Museum. Long after World War II ended, relics remained entombed in hidden corners of old battlefields. Sunk by time, abandoned tanks rusted in European bogs, planes rotted in Arctic ice, and ships rested silently in Europe's seas, ghostly time capsules left by the retreating, defeated, or deceased. Fate scattered these steel carcasses widely. Crippled tanks still dwell in the East European wetlands, where long-thawed Rasputitsa mud swallowed them during desperate 1943 fighting near Stalingrad. Artifacts surface surprisingly preserved when careful hands prod the memory-laden mud. The scale of unrecovered artifacts is staggering. While dug-up relics in marshlands are common, even weaponry as big as tanks still lingers in city areas. Recently in Germany, authorities found a pensioner's hidden basement arsenal housing a Panther tank, 88mm anti-aircraft gun, and torpedo. Elsewhere, near Arctic Circle crash sites, enthusiasts extracted well-kept 1940s warbirds, a wide-winged Ju-87 Stuka, and a slim BF-109 fighter, from their glacial tombs. Salvaging the past while honoring the fallen, wreck hunters rescue these steel demons, transforming them into conserved museum pieces that ensure remembrance outlives rust. The German Soldier's Toolbox The basic equipment of the German infantrymen included survival and fighting items covering a wide range. This loadout ranged from standard-issue small arms like rifles and pistols to explosive devices such as hand grenades, ammo pouches, camouflage smocks, Entrenching tools, rations, and medical supplies were also common. The standard rifle of German forces was the Karabiner 98K bolt-action design. First adopted in 1935, it remained the primary combat rifle throughout World War II, seeing action in every theater. The 98K was a sturdy and reliable weapon capable of mounting bayonets or grenade launcher attachments for additional flexibility. It gave the average Lanzer a rugged and accurate rifle. Submachine guns like the MP40 provided German troops with increased firepower. Firing pistol-caliber ammunition from a 32-round stick magazine, it was an effective close-quarters weapon. Its relatively low cost and ease of assembly saw over a million units produced during the war, making it a ubiquitous presence in the Wehrmacht's arsenal. The standard sidearm of the German military was the Walther P38 pistol. Developed as a replacement for the iconic but expensive Luger, the P-38 was the first locked breech pistol, and the first with a double-action trigger. Rugged and reliable, over one million were built and used by German personnel ranging from officers to tank crews. German infantry were also heavily equipped with explosive devices such as grenades. Utilizing concussive blast rather than shrapnel, the M-24 steel hand granite was their iconic stick grenade. Other common weapons included the anti-tank Panzerfaust, and rifle-launched grenades using a cup launcher attached to the muzzle. This varied toolbox of weaponry across all equipment categories provided German soldiers with sufficient tools for standard combat operations. Although innovative, production issues prevented Germany from matching the sheer industrial output of the Allies, contributing to its defeat. However, the extensive variety of weapons also meant a significant number that were left to be captured. The Deadly Legacy the fate of German weapons after defeat was not just about stockpiles and surpluses. It was also bound to the lasting legacy of German technological innovation in weapons development that continued to shape military research and geopolitical capabilities for decades after the Reich's defeat. Germany's World War military research programs produced revolutionary advances in areas ranging from rocketry and jet propulsion to assault rifles and submachine guns. These powerful new weapon systems, deployed in battle against the Allies, 
made a deep impression despite Germany's ultimate loss. Eager to gain an edge during the Cold War, the victorious Allied powers, especially the United States and the Soviet Union, invested extensive efforts into absorbing and reverse-engineering German technology for their own armament programs. Captured hardware was dissected, and German scientists extensively debriefed. The Nazis' V-2 ballistic missile became a foundation pillar for the nascent space programs of both superpowers. America's Cold War missile arsenal owed much to leased German engineering talent. Soviet MiG fighter jets derived thrust from German turbojet engines. Assault rifle development built on Nazi concepts. This deadly legacy meant German innovation continued to shape global conflict for years after World War II, as derivative superpower weapons stoked tensions. The post-war arms race was profoundly influenced by the arms and mines salvaged from the ruins of the Third Reich. German expertise ended up empowering both East and West. Nowhere was the impression of advanced German technology more apparent than in the Middle East. Soviet-supplied Arab militaries fielding reconditioned German panzers and anti-tank guns faced an Israeli military wielding surplus Nazi small arms, redesigned around German principles. The global dispersal of German weapons fueled the region's conflicts. Around the world, the weapons of the Reich cast a lasting shadow. Their widespread dissemination and the reverse engineering of Nazi innovation radically transformed the nature of warfare in the post-colonial world. The deadly legacy of German engineering prowess continued to ricochet through numerous Cold War conflicts. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.